The history of scientific method is a history of the methodology of scientific inquiry, as differentiated from a history of science in general. The development and elaboration of rules for scientific reasoning and investigation has not been straightforward. Scientific method has been the subject of intense and recurring debate throughout the history of science. And many eminent natural philosophers and scientists have argued for the primacy of one or another approach to establishing scientific knowledge. Despite the many disagreements about primacy of one approach over another, there also have been many identifiable trends and historical markers in the several millennia-long development of scientific method into present-day forms. Some of the most important debates in the history of scientific method center on rationalism, especially as advocated by René Descartes, inductivism, which rose to particular prominence with Isaac Newton and his followers, and hypothetico-deductivism, which came to the fore in the early 19th century. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a debate over realism versus Anti-realism was central to discussions of scientific method as powerful scientific theories extended beyond the realm of the observable. While in the mid-20th century some prominent philosophers argued against any universal rules of science at all. Early methodology There are few explicit discussions of scientific methodologies in surviving records from early cultures. The most that can be inferred about the approaches to undertaking science in this period stems from descriptions of early investigations into nature. In the surviving records, an Egyptian medical textbook, the Edwin Smith Papyrus, applies the following components examination, diagnosis, treatment and prognosis to the treatment of disease which display strong parallels to the basic empirical method of science and according to G. E. R. Lloyd played a significant role in the development of this methodology. The Ebers papyrus also contains evidence of traditional empiricism. By the middle of the first millennium BC in Mesopotamia, Babylonian astronomy had evolved into the earliest example of a scientific astronomy as it was the first and highly successful attempt at giving a refined mathematical description of astronomical phenomena, according to the historian Asker Aaboe. All subsequent varieties of scientific astronomy, in the Hellenistic world, in India, in Islam, and in the West, if not indeed all subsequent endeavor in the exact sciences, depend upon Babylonian astronomy in decisive and fundamental ways. The early Babylonians and Egyptians developed much technical knowledge, crafts, and mathematics used in practical tasks of divination, as well as a knowledge of medicine, and made lists of various kinds. While the Babylonians in particular had engaged in the earliest forms of an empirical mathematical science, with their early attempts at mathematically describing natural phenomena, they generally lacked underlying rational theories of nature. It was the ancient Greeks who engaged in the earliest forms of what is today recognized as a rational theoretical science, with the move towards a more rational understanding of nature which began at least since the Archaic period with the pre-Socratic school. Thales was the first to use natural explanations, proclaiming that every event had a natural cause. Even though he is known for saying, all things are full of gods, and scarified an ox when he discovered his theorem, Leucippus went on to develop the theory of atomism, the idea that everything is composed entirely of various imperishable, indivisible elements called atoms. This was elaborated in great detail by Democritus. Similar atomist ideas emerged independently among ancient Indian philosophers of the Nyaya, Vaisasika and Buddhist schools. In particular, like the Nyaya, Vaisasika and Buddhist schools, the Karvaka epistemology was also materialist, and skeptical enough to admit only perception as the basis for unconditionally true knowledge, while cautioning that if one could only infer a truth, then one must also harbor a doubt about that truth, an inferred truth could not be unconditional. Towards the middle of the 5th century BC, some of the components of a scientific tradition were already heavily established even before Plato.
who was an important contributor to this emerging tradition, thanks to the development of deductive reasoning, as propounded by his student, Aristotle. In Protagoras, Plato mentions the teaching of arithmetic, astronomy and geometry in schools. The philosophical ideas of this time were mostly freed from the constraints of everyday phenomena and common sense. This denial of reality as we experience it reaches an extreme in Parmenides who argued that the world is one and that change and subdivision do not exist. In the 3rd and 4th centuries BC, the Greek physicians Hero Philosophus of Chios employed experiments to further their medical research. Erasiostratus at one time, repeatedly weighing a caged bird, and noting its weight loss between feeding times. Aristotelian method Aristotle's inductive deductive method used inductions from observations to infer general principles, deductions from those principles to check against further observations, and more cycles of induction and deduction to continue the advance of knowledge organon is the standard collection of Aristotle's six works on logic. The name organon was given by Aristotle's followers, the peripatetics. The order of the works is not chronological but was deliberately chosen by Theophrastus to constitute a well-structured system. Indeed, parts of them seem to be a scheme of a lecture on logic. The arrangement of the works was made by Andronicus of Rhodes around 40 BC. The categories introduces Aristotle's tenfold classification of that which exists. Substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, situation, condition, action, and passion. On interpretation introduces Aristotle's conception of proposition and judgment, and the various relations between affirmative, negative, universal, and particular propositions. Aristotle discusses the square of opposition or square of Apuleius in chapter 7 and its appendix chapter 8. Chapter 9 deals with the problem of future contingents. The prior analytics introduces his syllogistic method, argues for its correctness, and discusses inductive inference. The posterior analytics deals with demonstration, definition, and scientific knowledge. The topics treats issues in constructing valid arguments, and inference that is probable, rather than certain. It is in this treatise that Aristotle mentions the predicables, later discussed by Porphyry and the scholastic logicians. The sophistical refutations gives a treatment of logical fallacies, and provides a key link to Aristotle's work on rhetoric. Aristotle's metaphysics has some points of overlap with the works making up the organon but is not traditionally considered part of it. Additionally, there are works on logic attributed, with varying degrees of plausibility, to Aristotle that were not known to the peripatetics. Aristotle introduced what may be called a scientific method. His demonstration method is found in posterior analytics. He provided another of the ingredients of scientific tradition, empiricism. For Aristotle, universal truths can be known from particular things via induction. To some extent then, Aristotle reconciles abstract thought with observation. Although it would be a mistake to imply that Aristotelian science is empirical in form. Indeed, Aristotle did not accept that knowledge acquired by induction could rightly be counted as scientific knowledge. Nevertheless, induction was a necessary preliminary to the main business of scientific inquiry, providing the primary premises required for scientific demonstrations. Aristotle largely ignored inductive reasoning in his treatment of scientific inquiry. To make it clear why this is so, consider this statement in the posterior analytics. We suppose ourselves to possess unqualified scientific knowledge of a thing, as opposed to knowing it in the accidental way in which the sophist knows when we think that we know the cause on which the fact depends, as the cause of that fact and of no other, and, further, that the fact could not be other than it is. It was therefore the work of the philosopher to demonstrate universal truths and to discover their causes. While induction was sufficient for discovering universals by generalization, it did not succeed in identifying causes. The tool Aristotle used for this was deductive reasoning in the form of syllogisms.
Using the syllogism, scientists could infer new universal truths from those already established. Aristotle developed a complete normative approach to scientific inquiry involving the syllogism which is discussed at length in his posterior analytics. A difficulty with this scheme lay in showing that derived truths have solid primary premises. Aristotle would not allow that demonstrations could be circular, supporting the conclusion by the premises, and the premises by the conclusion, nor would he allow an infinite number of middle terms between the primary premises and the conclusion. This leads to the question of how the primary premises are found or developed, and as mentioned above, Aristotle allowed that induction would be required for this task. Towards the end of the posterior analytics, Aristotle discusses knowledge imparted by induction. Thus it is clear that we must get to know the primary premises by induction, for the method by which even sense perception implants the universal is inductive. It follows that there will be no scientific knowledge of the primary premises. And since except intuition nothing can be truer than scientific knowledge, it will be intuition that apprehends the primary premises. If, therefore, it is the only other kind of true thinking except scientific knowing, intuition will be the originative source of scientific knowledge. The account leaves room for doubt regarding the nature and extent of his empiricism. In particular, it seems that Aristotle considers sense perception only as a vehicle for knowledge through intuition. He restricted his investigations in natural history to their natural settings, such as at the Pira Lagoon, now called Carlini, at Lesbos. Aristotle and Theophrastus together formulated the new science of biology, inductively case by case. For two years before Aristotle was called to tutor Alexander, Aristotle performed no modern style experiments in the form in which they appear in today's physics and chemistry experiments. Induction is not afforded the status of scientific reasoning, and so it is left to intuition to provide a solid foundation for Aristotle's science. With that said, Aristotle brings us somewhat closer an empirical science than his predecessors. Epicurus a scientific method in his work K alpha v omega v, Epicurus laid out his first rule for inquiry in physics, that the first concepts be seen, and that they not require demonstration. His second rule for inquiry was that prior to an investigation, we are to have self-evident concepts so that we might infer epsilon chi omega mu epsilon nu omicron iota sigma sigma eta mu epsilon iota omega sigma omicron mu epsilon epsilon alpha, both what is expected, tau pi omicron sigma mu epsilon nu omicron nu, and also what is non-apparent, tau alpha delta eta lambda omicron nu. Epicurus applies his method of inference of what is unobserved immediately to the atomic theory of Democritus. In Aristotle's prior analytics, Aristotle himself employs the use of signs. But Epicurus presented his canonic as rival to Aristotle's logic. C. Lucretius de Rerum Natura, a didactic poem explaining Epicurus of philosophy and physics.